Hello, I'm your host, Ray Dogum, and welcome to Vibecast. Thank you for joining us as we explore the exciting advancements in technology-enabled collaboration to excel important drug development. Vibebio seeks to find every cure for every community. We think big as no one should be left behind in the pursuit of living a healthy, happy, and productive life, free from disease. We see a future where communities of biopharma experts and patients collaborate to identify high potential medicines and have the ability to access capital to actually develop them. Vibecast is our weekly informational podcast where we explore some of the hottest topics in drug development and technology innovation with some of the dynamic people that make up the Vibe community. Join us to learn, imagine, question, and help us identify and develop solutions together. Our guest today is Vadim Nazarov, an AI and life sciences researcher turned startup founder who founded an AI-based drug discovery startup called Immunomind. Vadim, thank you so much for joining me today. How's your vibe like today? Hi, Ray, and thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, my uh, vibe mood today is quite good despite the rainy weather, so I'm looking forward to our exciting discussion. Awesome. Where are you calling us from today? From Warsaw, from the center of Europe. Very cool. Awesome. So if you don't mind kind of giving the audience a brief career journey mm -hmm. of, of yourself a little bit uh, so they understand your history and what you've been working on over the last over your career essentially mm -hmm. sure i'll be happy to uh, i have a quite crazy biography uh, so i started as a bioinformatician working in the top five uh, world's uh, laboratories focused on adaptive immunity research uh, led by dmitry chudakov and yuri Lebedev. i was a uh, informatician, then senior informatician, and then a group leader of around five people, where we worked on the intersection between bioinformatics, machine learning, and adaptive immunity research and immunotherapy development. So I'm coming from the immunology side of uh, biology, right? Uh, and um, despite having a computer science background, computer science, machine learning background, I uh, I'm very excited by the uh, by the immunological part of the world. Let's put it that way. So one of the highlights from my work is that as a part of my PhD, I developed an open source uh, package that is uh, you that is currently used for immune therapy development and data analysis uh, in large pharma and top uh, world universities. So I'm a big proponent of open source in science and bioinformatics. Well, and I'm quite a big critic uh, of open source in science as well. I'll be happy to talk about it uh, later. Uh, after my work in academia, uh, I got invited to a Canadian-Israeli uh, startup called TensorPod as a co-founder, chief AI officer and chief product officer. Uh, we developed a platform for machine learning engineers, machine learning researchers to manage their infrastructure and machine learning experiments. Imagine you have thousands of uh, deep learning models of artificial neural networks models, right? And you, you want to store them. You want to understand what's going on with them. You want to select the best one. It's quite similar to the drug development, right? Where you need to select the, the top uh, the best leads, for example, for, for subsequent experiments. Uh, and uh, so we uh, reached uh, quite good quite good metrics. But around uh, the end of 2019, we decided to pivot to uh, other domain, to a fintech. And fintech is, um, is a domain, financial technologies is a domain that is quite far away from uh, from me so uh, i made my own small exit to work on my other uh, ventures and around the beginning of 2020 me and my two co-founders and colleagues of many years uh, sergey and Vasily, we started immunomind with the idea of using machine learning technologies to design more efficient immune therapies with the focus on cell-based immunotherapies so we're talking car t and tcrt uh, therapies as our first uh, focus in 2020, we uh, finished Berkeley Skydeck Startup Accelerator, raised 750k thousand uh, dollars in our pre-seed funding from from uh, angel investors, Skydeck, and uh, US-based uh, venture funds. Uh, established established um, 
partnerships with top U.S. and Canadian universities published in Nature Communications recently. So it's quite an exciting journey. Um, an, addition, an additional branch, I would say, is um, my volunteering at, Ber at Berkeley Skydeck, uh, where I help with AI and biotech startups and just my um, mentoring of early stage or and or scientific uh, founders coming from academia to a startup world because I'm a scientist who turned startup founder myself uh, and because I saw quite a lot of uh, pain uh, in in this transition I think it's it's a, some sort of my uh, moral duty to help people if I know something right uh, that that could help them Sure. Yeah. Thank you for that. I appreciate the context and background. You know, it's interesting. A lot of scientists nowadays are finding their way into entrepreneurship and that journey is not easy, but it's something that's very rewarding in many cases. Yeah. Um, and, and in some cases it's, it's just a lot of extra stress and, uh, sleepless nights and things like that. So mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur scientist, um, you know, when you were thinking about coming up with this company, Immunomind, what was your vision like for, for the company? And yeah, we'll start there. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, the vision is uh, quite, uh, quite straightforward, is that when I worked as a bioinformatician, it was an edge of science, the field of uh, immune repertoires. So we're talking uh, repertoires of T cell receptors and B cell receptors. It was a new field back then, and I saw many opportunities in using this, um, this new technologies, this new type of data, if you allow me to, to talk as a machine learning engineer, to design new drugs, to design new, uh, new immune therapies. So the global vision uh, back then and well, behind Minomind is to be able to uh, use computational methods, machine learning, whatever. Uh, to to design new immune therapies, to design new uh, new cell therapies. So for me personally, um, this work combines uh, all my skills and what I like about different fields. Right? It's immunology. It's something unknown. Right? It's chaos uh, that is interesting to explore in both science and uh, well business. Right? Startup world. Uh, it's machine learning, and it is very. It requires. It is. It requires a high level of um, in, interdisciplinary knowledge, um, right? It requires a high level of this intellectual effort where you need to combine different aspects of different domains together, right? Um, and this really, uh, this truly inspires me, right? But you see, that's that's a catch, right? Uh, is that the dark side is uh, the same as the br bright side, right? So if you if you less if you if you're not a generalist, right? And if you think that um, you have a, uh, if you are not sure if you have enough resilience for uh, stress. Uh, for this stressful environment of startups, of early stage startups, right? Because we'll start there. It is, maybe you should think twice, at least twice about starting, uh, starting a startup. Because you see, that's the, the problem I see like 100% of time. And well, it was my problem as well. Um, that people, we, we uh, as a humanity, right? We, um, deeply underestimate uh, the amount of effort, the, the number of problems, right? The level of chaos or uncertainty in the, in the startup, in the startup world. There are, of course, of course, uh, there are different ways to overcome this, right? And, uh, well, you could, uh, uh, you could, um, gather, uh, gather a lot of financial capital, right? to de-risk yourself for a year or, or two, right? Or you could follow, and this is probably the more realistic uh, way, you could follow um, common ways um, successful startups follow, right? Uh, the question is, 
uh, whether these these ways are truly successful or uh, maybe there are just something that venture capital investors got used to, right? This is an open question, but still uh, there are some, you know, it's not algorithms uh, because there are no algorithms in, 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 in chaos, right? It's uh, only heuristics and trial and error, but there are some recommendations to do things in biotech or in AI for drug discovery uh, space. Interesting. Um, let's switch gears a little bit over and talk about how AI can actually help with drug discovery, which is what you're doing and mm -hmm. maybe defining what are the inputs that generate the AI models to help with drug discovery? Because the way I understand it is, of course, even with AI, garbage in, garbage out. Yes. In terms of what data you use. Yes. Um, but with machine learning, what's different is you can send a machine learning algorithm or a, a model 10 million images of a dog, different types of images of a dog. And it over time can learn that this mm -hmm. type of thing image is something that we call as humans, a dog, mm -hmm. but that's very well understood. So like a lot of people can, can detect a dog when they see one. Mm -hmm. However, with, with, uh, immunology and, um, and drug discovery, there's a lot of new information and novel data that's being generated that the world still, still doesn't understand about these molecules or chemicals or interactions. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Um, in a lot of ways, it's hard to find really good data that can pre have predictive um, characteristics yes. for for your model. Yes. So, so how big of a challenge is that, and what are people doing to try to solve, or what are you doing to, mm -hmm. to solve it? Right, right, right. Thank you so much for this uh, for this question, and thank you so much for mentioning the key principle, right? Garbage in, garbage out. Because I think. Um, this was, uh, this is, and this will be the uh, biggest problem for AI, uh, for drug discovery field, uh, because, well, because biology or immunology is again, chaotic, right? And, uh, you have lots of, uh, data problems, but yeah, uh, let me start with the overview, right? So, um, the key principle of AI for drug discovery is that, Let's use machine learning in place of uh, very long, very expensive laboratory experiments. Let's try, I don't know, to predict the state of a cell culture, uh, right? Or let's try to figure out what drugs will, what uh, lead candidates will work or, or, and what lead candidates will not work, right? As early as possible, right? And um, the, um, the, uh, the, the field, we can say that field is split up to two, uh, to two domains. The first one is closer to chemoinformatics. It's about AI for drug discovery for small molecules. And this is the most developed field as of, uh, as of today. I'm pretty sure you heard about AlphaFold, right, by DeepMind. <laughs> Uh, from Google, uh, and now this is uh, one of the examples, right, of this of this approach. But there are um, there are many other companies that started earlier and have been using this approach to design small molecules. Um, the most developed uh, ones are, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in silicon medicine, led by Alex Javarinkov, and I think they already have a, a drug in phase one or phase two, or phase two clinical uh, trial, right? And there are others, benevolent AI, exist existencia, um, a rec recursion, of course. And, um, and this is a very interesting time for both subdomain of AI for drug discovery for small molecules and AI for drug discovery in general is that um, we are, uh, we are almost Right. We are almost um, at the at the edge of knowing uh, whether or not these AI designed drugs will work, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, so it's you know it's it's very exciting, but a little bit stressful time because um, it really can shape the uh, shape the view of the of the of the industry, right? 
despite that we know that drug development is a, is a mess, right? And the success rate for drugs is very low. Still, we are not, uh, we are not at the same scale uh, in the F drug discovery space. We are not at the same scale in terms of number of drugs, like in the you know, traditional biotech, uh, so to speak. Not yet. Right? Not yet. Well, uh, hopefully not yet, right? right. And so, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Let me let me finish one or a couple of, of things because uh, if he, I want to talk more about these principles, right? So the idea is okay. Let's let's uh, predict something. Let's predict the efficacy. Let's let's uh, discover targets using machine learning uh, instead of uh, um, experiments. So let's do it in uh, several months instead of of years. And uh, the another principle behind this. Uh, this approach is is that it's not about quality it's about quantity so uh, machine learning algorithm um, doesn't doesn't give you doesn't give you a, you know a better answer right because it produces high quality results no 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 the idea is that you have so much data that you could um, you could screen this space of dip- different compounds of different uh, drugs um, at, at larger scale, and you could you could generate much much more potential candidates that you could um, test in the in the laboratory. Now, what would you do with them? It's it's your choice, right? For example, you could instead of testing more candidates on on later stages, right? Um, and uh, you could and um, and giving uh, the AI all the uh, all the responsibility for earlier stages of drug development. You could ask uh, machine learning systems to prioritize your your candidates. So, for example, uh, it generates you millions of compounds of compounds, and you ask a machine, this machine learning system to prioritize the top 10, 20, 100, um, depending on your capabilities for validating them on on the uh, on the later stages. And you know, we talked about how. You said small molecules have been, mm-hmm. that's one field that's been used for AI, with AI. Um, but there's also biologics, yes. therapies, m- mRNA technologies. Mm-hmm. Do you think that AI is still able to assist with these types of uh, discoveries, mm-hmm. drug discoveries? Or is it more, is it just more complex? Yes, I I definitely think um, I definitely think that it can help and it will help. The problem is, like you said, it is more complex because we're talking about biologics, right? We're talking about living cells, right? In terms of if, if we're talking about cell-based therapies, right? And it um, it, it ramps up the the difficulty, the the complexity, the complexity here. And you see. The whole approach to AI for drug discovery is um, is quite is quite different, and this is even earlier than um, than AI for drug discovery for 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 small molecules. So, because the process of drug development is a little bit uh, is a little bit a little bit um, different, and you need to be more careful here because you can't just um, you can't just isolate that. Okay. We have our chemical compound here, right? And on the later stages, we will uh, we will uh, introduce it to a patient or to a mice or or, 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 or whatever. The level of uh, interactions between this compound and living organisms is much higher. I, mean, I understand that I'm trying um, I'm trying to, to to talk more metaphorically and high level, right? To to, to 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 translate this 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 message is that you sure. you need to analyze with machine learning or any computational methods you need to analyze more things so to speak um, because we're talking more variable. yes more vari- more yeah. variables because we're talking about uh, lots of interactions between the environment right organism and the the drug the drug itself even on 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 the earlier uh, earlier stages right so again talking about um, cell therapies uh, when you when you uh, infuse car t's to a i don't know to a mice to a mice right you have a whole immune system uh, responding or changing itself 
uh, right to to this to this to this process and you need to design a drug that that um that uh, that adapts right or, or or changes something in a in, in in response to this response so um the the complexity is is much higher and um, it means that also the data is um is much more well complicated and mm -hmm. and um getting back to the principle of garbage in garbage garbage out i think this is the this again this was this is and this will be the biggest problem for for well for any biotech right for any drug development but for ai for drug discovery um, as well because for these machine learning models for computational methods you really need a uh, very uh, high quality data and now how how can you realistically make high quality data when you have different de devices different hardware producing uh, uh well, same type of data right some sequencing for example but the, we're talking about completely different hardware right we're talking about completely different environment we're talking about completely different people who are doing uh, these these experiments right and um, this is a very big problem this is a very big problem and i think it doesn't it will not go uh so, so still a problem to be solved uh, yeah. over time. So you mentioned how, uh, you know, you developed an open source package mm -hmm. for data analysis that uh, pharma companies are using for T cells and antibody data. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? And then mm -hmm. talk to me about how you said open source, you're pro open source, yeah. but you're also a critic right. of open source. I, I want to unpack that a bit. Right. Uh, but let's start with the, what you built and what they're using it for right right so at that time it was an air package r package um, uh, focused on more explora exploratory data analysis of t cells and and b cells and the idea i think the principle that got it so popular is that uh, i made it very simple to use so i did uh, some sort of a customer development i didn't know about startups anything right uh, i just did my own small uh, customer customer development to understand uh, to understand what were the challenges in 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 analysis in the analysis of immune system and i learned that people who are coming from the uh, people biologists right who are coming from the biological or medical medical background they um they, they, it's really hard for them to do a data, a data analysis. So um, the, it's hard for them because you see, it's not, there is no data analysis. There are at least three components to this process. You need to code, you need to, to, to do the coding. Um, you need to think about what to do. And you need to design algorithms to do this stuff. Right. So there are the, these are three different activities um, and you need to master all of them to do a high level data data analysis. So what I tried to do, I tried to uh, to simplify the coding and algorithm part by providing very simple, very simple functions to use for data analysis. But inside these functions, there were, there were all the complexity, right? These functions were hiding uh, the complexity, the complex pipelines to do, to, do the, to do the data analysis. And I think uh, this is a great way for, uh, for scientific founders to jumpstart their career in, in, in startup, in the startup world, because thanks to, to your open source wor work, you not only get uh, publications, right? You get recognition from, from your scientific peers. Uh, you can talk to them. So you build your uh, reputation, you build your, you build your uh, network and, um, uh, you probably, you can build a network inside pharma companies who potentially are your uh, future customers if you want to monetize this uh, open source solution, or if you want to do something similar or maybe not so similar uh, in, the, in, in the future. And well, many venture capitalists uh, like uh, open source, right? Because this is a 
some sort of uh, validation of your work and that you can this is a success story and a validation that you can think and work on something that people need that people need and right. this is very important because sometimes scientists got caught up in the beauty of science or maybe in the grunt work uh, and you know science for the sake of science um, is great from the foundational perspective but if you're talking about startups right venture capitalists uh, will not give you money for foundational science sadly right but that's the goal of grants interesting yeah and like with open source um there's also the i mean i'm a pro open source person as well but the disadvantage of others using your platform for free you know so maybe a vc may see that and say what's your business model yeah so yeah. That, just another would that be another criticism against open source would you say um i think it i don't think it, it i don't think it's a, it's a criticism of open source itself right because it really okay. it really depends on the market condition and it really it really depends on what are you what are your goals here and uh, what are the goals of uh, of investors, of venture capital investors, if you plan to raise venture capital, of course, right? Because for the market conditions, look, if you design an open source tool that is truly needed in all, do in, in many domains, right? Or this is a critical tool uh, for a specific domain, I don't think there will be any problems on the on the capital side, right? On the fin financial uh, financial side. But you see, it it really depends yeah, on um, what you want, of, of what you want to do, and this is really um, this related to my um, criticism of open source, of scientific open source, is that you see, it's very easy to publish an open source tool, and the whole system, uh, the whole system is uh, incentivizes you to publish more. But it, did, it but it doesn't provide an infrastructure uh, capital for 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 you know supporting what you published right or even for making what people really want because if you go if your goal is a publication you just publish your uh, this paper right and that's it and we have uh, in, in in bioinformatics right we have many of the um, I don't know I don't know how to call them dead right or undead bioinformatics software tools um which uh well not not just hard to use right they're impossible to install on your on your pc or on your server and i mean can we blame people for it i don't know i, I will not answer this question right but i will highlight that the whole system is really hard is is, is really hard is really harsh i would say for for people who want who want to do this open source work and continue supporting their open source work for many years past this initial publication. So I understand your startup, um, you know, you had to raise money in Eastern Europe and I'm just wondering no. if, you know, geographically or, you know, politically mm -hmm. speaking, if there's been any issues for startups in Eastern Europe trying to raise money and what's your experience been like? Well, you see, I am, um, um, I see. Well, and I know I, that you were lucky because you sort of had US investors, so it was right. a kind of different situation for you. So you see, but, but it was the goal from the very beginning, right? Because um, okay. we, we, and well, I quite, I'm quite familiar with the uh, with the startup ecosystem in uh, Central and Eastern uh, Europe, and it is still emerging. There, of course, there are success stories, right? There are uh, there are some unicorns and so on but the biggest problem as i can see uh, well one of the biggest problems uh, with the uh, startup ecosystem in central and eastern europe is that people really people don't really understand what a startup is right so startup is about this high risk high reward and new technology that can reshape the industry, right? Um, it's about new, uh, it's about new ways to do some completely new ways to do something. Uh, but 
Right. It's about disruption in many cases. Yes, 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 yes. So, and people in the US, in UK, and maybe some people in, in Western uh, Europe, in my experience, uh, they, they understand it, right? I mean, just look at the number of unicorns by, 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 by countries, right? And the whole idea of venture capital, as I can see it as, as people, I don't know, uh, Mark Andreessen, for example, from A16Z, uh, the, the whole idea of venture capital is that, okay, you go very early, you go in, in you invest in very, um, you invest in high risk, high reward uh, technologies, and you really don't invest all your money in one startup. You, if you have a, I don't know, one million, right? You invest 100K in 10 startups, and uh, your fellow venture capital investors do the same. In this case, you get this de risk, right? You, you, you hedge your risks and your fellow venture capital investors as well, right? And so if some of these startups fail, I mean, most of them will, will fail, right? Uh, then you, you don't suffer catastrophic, um, catastrophic damage. I don't think, I don't see the same, the same thinking framework here in Poland or in Central and uh, Eastern Europe. People look at startups more like at the private equity, is that you want, they want to have a detailed financial, uh, financial model of financial model for next, I don't know, five, seven years, right? Uh, from early stage startup, startups, right? It's, it's fine to ask for a financial model, but uh, if you invest in an early stage startup, you want you need to understand that there are, there are many possibilities to pivot, and in reality, you invest in people and maybe in some technologies. In, if we're talking about deep tech or or biotech, but it's it's about it's about investing in pivot. Who, sorry, in pivot, uh, investing in in people uh, who who will probably pivot and. Um, and you need to invest in many such teams. And people, people either invest uh, to uh, to small, well, much smaller amounts of money in 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 deep tech or biotech investors, or they invest all all their money in uh, all their capital in one in one startup, right? And then they get disillusioned with venture capital because the startup uh, failed. Right, but that's not how you do venture capital, right? It's venture capital yeah. as a, as entrepreneurship. Venture capital is about taking the risks. You just uh, you just take many smaller risks by spreading your capital uh, around many startups, right? Sure, it's part of the it's part of the understanding, um, yeah. and a risk that they must take. Yes, be part of that ecosystem. Yes. So, how is the current economic environment affecting deal flow from your perspective and investments uh, into early stage mm -hmm. biotech companies? Is this something you're familiar with? Right. So, in my experience and in ex uh, and in experience of my many of my for startup founder founder friends, it's um, it's much harsher. Than, uh, than than before, and the general the general notion is that uh, the um, the general mood is that uh, investors uh, got very risk averse, right? Uh, they they stopped leading rounds, right? So they just follow other investors. Um, they ask for a, uh, for a much harsher due diligence, but well not all investors really have right experts to do a proper and correct, I would say, due, 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 due diligence on, on, on startups. Um, and yeah, people, people just got very risk averse. I mean, it's, uh, it's obvious, right? Uh, economic crisis, uh, war, war on Ukraine and so on. So, uh, but, but sometimes it's really um, from the, startup founder perspective, sometimes it's really, well, uh, bizarre, right? Right. And sometimes, it, sometimes it's really hard to understand the reasoning bef behind, um, both investments and, well, uh, investments decline, uh, deci decisions, right? So it's, so, um, 
I was thinking that maybe it is related to um, again some changes in the in the strategy, but um, I think people just got very risk averse. Some of 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 people, some of investors, they maybe they are not very open about it to startups. Uh, so we, I feel like there is a much more much more com communication gap communication disconnect between investors and startups uh, as of as of today right everyone ever everyone is uh, is is stressed right simple simple as that as that right so it it, it leads to some problems with communications uh, problems with decision making uh, and uh, and so so you know having been part of accelerators and working with investors and different types of startups. What kind of support do you think early stage biotech companies need to make them successful? Mm -hmm. Right. So um, the problem with business or with with the startup world it's it's uh, is that it is very chaotic. It it is very uncertain. It means that there are no algorithms and you need to do the trial and error, error by yourself. There is, there is one great book on entrepreneurship called Disciplined Entrepreneurship by a professor from MIT, right? And well, it is, um, it is great. It's, a, it's a some sort of an algorithm, right? But you still need to adapt it to your, uh, to your realities. I highly recommend this book to all early stage or uh, early stage founders or scientists who, who, who plan to do uh, to do the business uh, earlier. So, in order to in order to really de-risk uh, your 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 path, you need to have an access to this experience. You need to have an, an access to to business experience from more seasoned entrepreneurs because these people uh, will will guide you or maybe they will be a CEO of your company or maybe just an advisor or mentor, but they will show you these um, hidden uh, currents, so to speak, right? Or hidden meanings uh, or maybe some insider information uh, that will greatly help you and, and, and de-risk you. For example, there are many accelerators, startup accelerators, which just um, take uh, take a startup, right? Take equity, ask for money for participating in a startup accelerator without giving back a a anything, uh, any any capital, right? And they promise that they will introduce you to some to their investor network, right? You know, maybe you should be careful with these uh, people. Maybe you should, uh, maybe you should uh, ask your business advisor to do a, some sort of a due diligence or on a such uh, startup accelerator. Right to 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 help you understand uh, whether or not there will be any value from uh, fr from it. And you see, it's the same with it's the same with any other any other uh, domain. You need to have uh, an easy access to this experience, so you can uh, ask questions, uh, get an advice or, or or feedback, and do your own trial and error. Right to get this experience by 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 yourself, and I think for Europe it's uh, one of the if not the biggest problem uh, is the it is the lack of seasoned entrepreneurs uh, who could help uh, guide uh, early stage early, early stage uh, startups. There are lots of consultants right uh, there without any entrepreneur experience or uh, ex governmental uh, workers again with without no entrepreneurial experiments and you need to be well you see um if you're if you're an early stage founder you don't understand that you don't understand right you don't know that you don't know something you don't know that yeah. uh you don't know that you don't know maybe they will not help you or 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 maybe you you maybe they they can help you in other domains right that you're not expecting so I think it's all about finding uh, a mentor, an advisor, just friend, uh, whatever, whatever with this uh, seasoned, or oh, sorry, with uh, with this entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurial experience. Final question before we conclude here: What kind of specific technologies do you see making 
the biggest impact on human health in the next few years. Mm -hmm. So I'm so you know mm -hmm. there's so many different types of immune you know biotech technologies or other technologies AI digital technologies or maybe things that we don't know. But what mm -hmm. do you see as being could have the biggest impact? Right, right. So um, because. Um, because of the nature of biology, I'm not sure if it's even possible to, to predict it, right? So um, I would like not to, pre not to predict it, uh, but I can, share, um, I can share a couple of my own personal, so to speak, strategic bets. And the first bet is about integration of different types of data. Uh, metaphorically speaking, we want to view the drug, drugs or organisms from different from different uh, sides, right? From different perspectives, and you know, you 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 can do that. You can do this if you can integrate completely different, or maybe not so completely different types of data in a coherent form. So, um, so when you can look, you know, at the same process from uh, different perspectives, um, and. The other and the other strategic bet is definitely infrastructure. Because uh, I think, and uh, this is related to the AI for drug discovery domain. I think I think AI for drug discovery domain is um, is lagging behind the uh, enterprise AI, and uh, in the enterprise AI field, uh, we're talking about you know some consumer application or financial technologies or you know I don't know retail logistics and so on. Uh, in 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 in, in, the, in enterprise AI. The, we are already people already passed this uh, stage of you know let's create new machine learning models right let's create new AI models. Uh, the current focus is more on the infra infrastructure part. It's about again data. Uh, so b before before machine learning models right it's about data or it's about uh, it's about putting machine learning models in production right so. Um, in in real in real world, right? In, and this is uh, after uh, you develop a machine learning model. And I think uh, AI for drug discovery space uh, will slowly move. Well, may, maybe not slowly move towards, right? But will slowly integrate more and more components from the data infrastructure, uh, data infrastructure space, so to speak. And um, you see. The, the problem and the underlying problem here, here is 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 uh, is very straightforward. Is that uh, the data the the data is growing much faster than uh, companies uh, are growing, right? So you have uh, the the number of uh, terabytes or gigabytes per person per employee of a biotech company, right? It's it's going up very fast, and well, it uh, it it will not it won't be changing any 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 any, any soon, right? And new and new types of data will generate even more data, even more complicated data, right? So data infrastructure pro problems will not go anywhere, and um, so I'm personally looking more and more into this in, into this space. Infrastructure, yeah, yeah, infrastructure is definitely a place to keep you know our focus yeah. our attention on uh vadim i want to thank you so much for your time today and i appreciate you coming on the show and sharing a little bit about ai and drug discovery and your company immunovine thank you Ray. um thank you is there anything else you want to share with the audience before we conclude well i i would like i would like uh to say good luck with uh, with your future future startups so good luck but be careful and ask someone okay and everything will be fine. Get a mentor. Mentorship's important, yeah. I understand. Thanks.